Okay, welcome to Talking Heads episode nine. This one's sponsored by Bennett's Classic Bike Insurance, and this should be a really interesting one. I'm really looking forward to this one. We've got three people here who spend their time promoting motorcycling around around the UK and, and beyond. And there's a lot of talk in, in the press at the moment, in the media, about how our transport is going to change um, post-pandemic. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of that about motorcycling. So we've invited three people to, to try and change that, really. So we have um, Tony Campbell, who's head of the MCIA. We have Dutch from Bike Shed. And we've got Colin Brown, who is the, who is the director of is it campaigns for MAG. Director of Campaigns and Political Engagement is my full job, in t- job title. Yeah, that sounds like a big job. I think, well, to be fair, all three of you are busy, um, I would imagine. At the moment. So just to start with, really, I guess, uh, just for each of you, to just, just a quick couple of minutes on what's taking up your time at the moment? What's the, what's the focus of your, your lives at the moment? Do you want to go first, Tony? Welcome to everybody, and it's great to be invited onto, uh, onto this uh, video conference. So uh, thank you and welcome to everybody. Um, Obviously, as a member organisation, we represent the sort of supply side of the industry. So manufacturers, um, you know, business really covering the full scope of, uh, of motorcycling. Um, and our, our, our lives at the moment are fully consumed with supporting our members with the latest uh, government advice. Uh, and of course, as you would hope and everybody would hope is that we're doing everything we can to make sure that motorcycling is at the forefront of, uh, of all of the political minds uh, around transport and some of the challenges that we're going to face, you know, not just now, but what seems to be for the foreseeable future. So, you know, we see it as a great opportunity uh, for this industry, uh, but we're still struggling to overcome some of those challenges and some of those preconceptions about motorcycling, particularly uh, in the sort of political field. Uh, and uh, and therefore, you know, we're just working hard uh, and making sure that we um, that we get heard uh, and we get fully considered. And clearly, from the uh, the announcements that took place over the weekend from the transport minister, and then again from the prime minister on Sunday night, although there was a lot of uh, lot of hot air, um, the reality is is that we're still not considered as part of that landscape, which is obviously is uh, our mission to change that. Thanks for that, Dutch. Do you want to? Tell us about there's a lot going on with Bike Shed at the moment. Yeah, I mean, obviously, Bike Shed's closed, which sucks. Um, so all our staff are furloughed. Um, and, uh, and Vicky had the bright idea of why don't we use our community to try and do something useful, which we thought was a good plan. And that spiralled into this huge project, um, which is the, the sort of, uh, I guess we, we kind of struggled with what to call it, really. But we've ended up calling ourselves the Bike Shed Community Response um, Volunteer Riders, which doesn't exactly trip off the tongue. But we've got um, around 600 riders um, running around the UK on an app called Gopher and uh, mostly picking up and delivering PPE all around Britain, which is brilliant. Um, We're also getting into a few other tasks. We've done a little bit of food distribution and we're now moving into medicine and pharmaceuticals, prescription medicine. And uh, last night, um, overnight, we kicked off a project with the NHS and the Royal Free Hospital, which is the Urgent Oximeter Response Initiative, along with Team Rubicon as part of Op React, if I've thrown in enough names there, um, which basically um, is dealing with a lot of people who are dying um, of what they call silent hypoxia, where people think they're well enough to stay at home with COVID-19, but they're not. They're actually hypoxic. They haven't got enough oxygen in their blood. They slowly deteriorate and you can't tell by looking at them and then they pop their clogs. So um, our riders are delivering oxygen probes to those people. So a call comes in on 111 and uh, an NHS clinician will refer um, a job to us for one of our riders to rush an oxygen probe to their house and then they keep it um, and monitor their oxygen and then they know if they should be in hospital or not. So we're flat out doing that. Um, other bike business for us um, is really about just surviving a lockdown closed business where we've got 65 staff on furlough um, whilst we're still building out our LA venue and hoping that at some point we'll be able to open that. So things are a bit of a mess. Um, and so it's quite confusing. We're really, really busy, but obviously we're not earning any money. So that kind of sucks. Um, and in terms of the outlook for the industry, I mean, obviously we're following very closely and always have through, you know, the We Ride London thing that we do, you know, to try and make sure that motorcycles are on people's mind when it comes to transport planning. But I'm, I'm sad to say, I just think that's a losing battle. People basically think motorcycle riders are broadly wankers. 
and uh, they don't like us much. It's very difficult to get them to see us as a solution to transport problems anywhere in the UK. It works well in other countries around the world, but we really need to put proper pressure to bear by being visually present um, to get people to look at us as the fantastic solution to congested cities that we are. And, and I think, um, you know, my gut feeling is that with everybody sort of out in the parks in this artificial kind of early summer, spring, and people are all thinking, you know, navel gazing about how the world could be a better place and we could all be a little bit more green. I don't think people are thinking motorcycles first. Um, I think people are um, swept into the illusion that somehow we have something in common with Amsterdam when we don't because we're not that small or summoning something in common with California where we don't have the weather and we should all be on bicycles. And I think we're going to have to fight really, really, really hard if, um, if the government or anybody else is going to look to us to go, what a fantastic solution to transport in congested cities post COVID-19. I think we're going to end up even more looking at kind of green initiatives and, uh, and, and I, I think, yeah, it's going to be an uphill battle, but obviously we're not giving up. And the, the only caveat to that, or, or I guess the opposition to that would be, um, I think emerging from this, people are really going to have a sense of what a lot of millennials and teenagers have. You only live once. Um, I think what this pandemic has really shown is that life is precious and life is short. So if you ever thought about getting a motorcycle or taking your motorcycle test or getting a bike or doing that, long way round, long way up, long way down trip and being a Ewan and Charlie or whether you want to live your dreams and be a biker. After this, you're going to want to do it. So I think from a consumer point of view, I think biking is going to be really popular and, uh, and, and people are really going to want to fulfill their passions. So I think from a consumer side, I think there's going to be a huge will. But I think from a government side, I think it's a real battle. That's really, that seems to lead really nicely into, uh, into Colin, I think. <laughs> I, I guess... You're you're the guy who, you know, you speak to, to all kind of councils, governments, government officials, an awful lot, along with Tony, I guess. What's your take on it? Then? Yeah, I mean, obviously, for from the point of view of the motorcycle action group, there's um, an awful lot of I think confusion uh, out there. Um, I mean, even sort of like mo monitoring um, uh, social media, uh, I, I, I've seen a couple of comments that say saying things like. Uh, why is MAG using the coronavirus as an excuse to sit on its hands and do nothing? Uh, that's a clear misunderstanding of how much work we are actually doing. We're probably busier now in the lockdown than we were before the lockdown. Uh, the amount of effort that is going into uh, recognising motorcycles as a transport solution in all this um, is, has been stepped up to, a, to a, an increased level that, that you know, we, we haven't had before. Um, there's an awful lot of consultations that have been raised by the government that are still ongoing. They don't seem to be de being delayed, but delay de debate on those uh, consultations seems to be off the table. So it's very much a case of, yeah, we're having a, con co uh, a consultation, uh, ask everybody for, for written input, but ultimately there's no real debate around it. So it's very hard to get traction for to get um, people like our MAG members who we always encourage to to take part in consultations to actually know what's going on because all the news coverage is on one subject and one subject only. Um, so yeah, as as Winston Churchill said, you never 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 waste a crisis. Um, so there are opportunities to be had, um, and I think if we play play our cards right, we can get positive benefits out of this. Um, but it is certainly not something that is going to be easy. Uh, it is not something that. Uh, we can assume is going to happen if nobody actually steps into the breach to make these uh, these representations to government and to to ministers and to to members of parliament. Um, and again, it, it's an issue that yes, central government is is somewhere where we need to lobby hard, but we also need to look at what's happening locally and regionally with uh, with the various councils. Um, you, as you know, Steve, we've had a had a big run in with Oxfordshire uh, recently. Um, it is clear that there's a, an anti-motorcycle bias that is built into the system at the moment um, and we've got to do everything we can to change that. So we're not going to get anywhere, as Dutch was saying, the vast majority of people have a very dim view of motorcycling. We as people who actually uh, love motorcycling, we know that it's not, not as bad as everybody makes out, but we've got to get that message across to others. Um, and certainly coming out of this pandemic, 
if we get everybody jumping on their bike and doing wheelies down down the local high street because they think there's less traffic around that's not going to do us any favors at all we've got to get sensible um responsible riding going on in this uh transition out of lockdown yeah it's it's, it's really interesting We're, when we were having a conversation in the in the bike social office about this episode we we saw you three guys in in very different roles in this and, and forgive me if i if we've misinterpreted this but it it sort of feels like tony's role in the mcia is very much about his Here's a vision for the future of motorcycling, Here's the, which, you know, we know the vision includes um, the, the whole sort of powered light vehicles and, and this sort of, you know, transition from just thinking about it as motorcycles to, to a broader class. We've got MAG who are almost sort of fighting for the here and now. And, uh, you know, and, and whilst, whilst the MCIA are, are working hard on the, the big vision for the future, MAG are other people who are, who are kind of fighting for our rights to carry on riding now. And then we've got Bike Shed is, is a really good example of, of just promoting the benefits of motorcycling and making motorcycling seem like a really cool, easy thing that people should should want to do, and and I, I don't know if that's how you guys see your roles, but it... I, I think that's I think that's sort of very fair comment. Um, what I would say is, and the point I've tried to make since uh, since I arrived at the MCIA is is that recognising what both Dutch and uh, what Colin have said is that the reputation for motorcycling is, is not a good picture. So what, what became very, very evident early days for me was is that unfortunately it was road safety that was leading most people's thought processes. And of course, to a large part of the population, a motorcycle is fast, noisy, dirty, and absolutely dangerous. And it terrorizes my local neighborhood at the weekend and I'm fed up with hearing about it. You then get a civil service and a government that thinks consistent to that then of course it was become very evident that actually we were no longer present in that whole debate. Dutch is absolutely right. Trying to get shift within government to think differently about this sector more in more broad terms meant that we had to put a different suit on. There was no point in turning up, making an argument for the past when we had to create some sort of vision for the future. And what was really important for us was trying to get the reset button pressed to say, look, I know that's your image of motorcycling. If it wasn't for the increase in people using um, power two wheelers to deliver food at Amazon parcels and a lot of the great initiatives, which D Dutch explained earlier on, then the reality is the demographic for motorcyclists is unfortunately Dutch is a younger fella, I think, than the rest of us on this call. But, you know, the reality is it's mid 50s, people with disposable income. Uh, enjoying their bike at the weekend not really using it it's not a real necessity to get around and what I said to the road safety people was I said look if we didn't see this increase in last mile in our sector this problem probably in the next 10 years will go away for you you probably won't have to do anything and road safety will take care of itself but the reality is we're a sector that has so much to offer and I think it's been ignored for so long. And therefore, it's important that we had to present the argument in a different way. And COVID-19 has magnified that whole chat, that, that opportunity. But the reality is, is that the climate agenda has really gained some momentum. And like Dutch said, people sat in parks going, wouldn't it great, be great? I don't want to go back to life before. Well, life still has to be paid for and business has to continue. So therefore life will resume back to something like it looked in the past at some point with some maybe some measures that may last longer than we're expecting but either way there's no there's no magic fix for this and i think this sector whether it is a traditional motorcycle or whether it's something that's not yet on the market and there's lots of new technologies coming through is that we have a place to be part of that landscape i genuinely think we've made some good progress have we made the progress we would have hoped for at this point well i think the announcements over the weekend demonstrated that probably not but as i said we're venting in our frustration i wrote to the minister on thursday i wrote to him again yesterday with downing street and copy expressing our absolute dissatisfaction that we're not being acknowledged as part of the solution and uh, and we had a call yesterday with the dft where i completely lost the plot with them in terms of their thinking and this was primarily around their urgency around legalizing electric micro scooters which have a place but the reality is is that they they don't they don't bridge that gap between walking and cycling mm. and other transport modes 
and their constant ignorance and naivety around what this sector can offer. As I said, for me, I, I, I just, I, you know, honestly, I feel at my wit's end with it. But genuinely, you know, we're pushing so, so hard at the moment. Uh, and, and I'm hoping that, as I said, COVID-19 will give us uh, the breakthrough that we're hoping for. I think from my point of view, I mean, I, I, you know, Steve, I like your sort of summary at the, at the beginning, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, Tony here is representing the industry. And I think there's a powerful message for government in terms of motorcycling in this country is a great industry. We've got great brands here that are building motorcycles that deserve to be supported. Um, and so I think there's, there's a huge thing around the economy and, and the role that powered two-wheeled vehicles, regardless of what engines they are or how they're powered, should play a role in big city transportation. Uh, yeah. And I think that's a really important thing. I think one of the, the big issues that we face in London is that they're desperate to push everybody onto motorcycles. But if they looked at two wheelers, powered or unpowered as a single category of silhouette on the road, um, they would realize that a lot of people, if, you know, if, if you live more than three, four miles away, cycling is a rich man's middle class game for people who are fit and who don't need to wear a suit to work and haven't got a lot to carry. And in a way, it's sort of discriminatory. You know, you, you need to open it up to people that need to go further and, and also deal with bad weather, which is going to turn up in six, eight months time. So if we can get the industry to look at two wheels on the road, not look at whether it's a bicycle or electric or petrol, just look at that. I think that would really help. But also the economic angle of businesses that rely on it that deserve a place. You know, we have a right to operate. I think in terms of MAG, I think MAG should be out there making noise and organizing demonstrations and having riders on the road doing stuff whilst trying to make sure people behave themselves. That's a battle we're always going to have. Mm. I think the role I see at Bike Shed is actually, sounds a bit sort of wanky, but I think our job is to try and make biking cool. Mm. Um, I think if we can make biking cool, relevant and interesting, but biking's always been in the mainstream, which is why, you know, Chris Pratt is being chased by dinosaurs on a triumph in, in Jurassic Park. It's always going to be there. And I think our job is to amplify that. So when people do think about motorcycle riders, instead of thinking about Sons of Anarchy and Asbo riders on fireblades doing 160 miles an hour on the back wheel up the road, they actually think about the distinguished gentleman's ride, or they think about a CEO in a, in a bell staff jacket riding a classic Triumph on the weekends. I think it's quite good. Or uh, also, we, you know, we do a lot of stuff with brands like Super 73 that have those kind of powered pedal two wheel bikes, but they lean on motorcycle culture, not bicycle culture. Yeah. So I think our role is actually to make it cool, fresh, interesting, urban, relevant and part of mainstream culture and move away from the cliches, get away from the idea of sort of speed and, and into bikes that are actually about leisure and lifestyle and move into the world of classic cars and preservation of culture and pres preservation of lifestyle and storytelling and adventure and leverage Charlie Borman on bikes doing the long way up with Ewan and what that looks like. And so we're about the storytelling bit. So I think between the three of us, we need to have a sort of a three-way attack where we're sort of all playing our role. And in some ways, you know, we need to have more conversations like this where we get coordinated and, and we play our roles accordingly. But it is an uphill battle. You know, at the end mm. of the day, it, you know, the, the biggest shift is a shift in perception as to who we are. And, uh, and that's always going to be a tough one. Well, you saw that. I mean, I, I, I sort of, I guess because, we, you know, we spend our days riding bikes, talking about bikes, thinking about bikes, you forget sometimes that other people don't do that. And, and, and for me, a couple of weeks ago, when I, when the, I, I wrote, I spoke a column about the thing, what's happening in Oxfordshire and, and reading the papers that Oxfordshire had put out for that, you know, for that survey was just a real, it, it just puts you right back in it as to just how much prejudice there is. I don't know. I don't know if you guys have seen that. Obviously, Colin has. Um, but the difference between the motorcycling paper for that and the cycling paper and the equestrian paper in particular were just. It was just crazy. There's a couple of points that have been made by um, Tony and uh, and Dutch there that I'd kind of like to address. Um, I mean, for, for, from the from the get go, Steve. I mean, you obviously said that yeah, you 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 recognise Mag as as representing riders in the here and now. Um, and our rights on the road at, right now. I think that's a little bit of a misunderstanding of where, where MAG goes because we are very much about the future of motorcycling. Um, yeah, yeah. like, like I say, it's, I'm not, not taking offence in any way. I'm, I'm just trying to... It's, it's always interesting to hear how people uh, verbalise what MAG's about because that helps you to understand what image we're actually portraying to people because that's how, what's clearly coming through from the messaging. 
Um, but I think it's important to note that, that MAG is about the future of motorcycling because that's the only way we protect the present. And if you look at the, uh, the government position, uh, all the policy papers, it's as if motorcycling already doesn't exist because it doesn't even get a mention. You know, it's not, it's not a case that we're fighting against people saying bad things about motorcycling. We're fighting for people to actually mention motorcycling. You know, it's not, it's not a case of, um, uh, yeah, this is, this is a, a legitimate transport mode that, that gets mentioned in the list. So when, when Boris says, if you, if you can't use public transport, use a car, use cycling or, you, you, or, or walk. Well, what about the other transport mode that you've not mentioned? Uh, I mean, the government is looking at introducing this, what they call micro-mobility, a term which I hate, um, which obviously refers to the, the stand on electric scooters. Why the hell don't you concentrate on the transport modes that you've already got on the road that are fully regulated? We know how they work. We know how to, how to release the benefits from them. Why do we need to start looking at a new form of transport with all the, all the problems that you're gonna get with introducing that? Let's concentrate on what we've got now because that is the way we protect motorcycling for the future. Yeah, the problem, Colin, um, you make some great points. And if you'd have listened to the call that I had yesterday with the DFT, and uh, it was primarily uh, about uh, some other challenges we've got in industry around uh, Euro 5 that's uh, sort of introduced this year. Um, but one of the items on the agenda was uh, about the micro-mobility consultation that's out there that's been extended. But of course, the transport minister decided uh, at the weekend that it was a good idea to basically fast track uh, micro mobility. Um, and this, you, you make the point I've been making from day one, listen, you're hoodwinked into thinking there's some magic solution out there, or if you do, you're going to end up with issues that I can tell you now, history already tells me you've faced those issues in the past, which is why motorcycling uh, power two wheelers face the regulation that it does today. The regulation is a result of trying to make riding a motorcycle or a moped or a scooter safer. And that's why regulation over the last 30, 40 years has evolved in the way it has. What you're saying is let's open up a new sector, which is fine, unregulated predominantly because we've got a minister or a government think it's part of that magic solution. I think it has a role to play, but it doesn't fulfill all of the, the, the requirements that are out there. And like you've said, Colin, there is a sector that can already play its game. Now, the problem is, and I've said it so many times and been criticized two years ago when I said, when you talk, when you mention the word motorcycle to a, a room full of 100 people, the law of averages tell us that three people in the room will probably motorcyclists. And the other 97, and if I said list down the things which you, you think are associated with motorcycling, that is what builds the picture. And in government, generally, other than the odd occasion, there's no motorcyclist there. They look at Stats 19, they look at the accident statistics, and they say, that's a problem. And the reason why it don't exist, I'll tell you why it don't exist, because in the early 90s, when we had the famous born-again phenomenon, early mid-90s, is guess what? The manufacturers chased me and you and, and Steve down the road to say, I'm going to, it's like the evolution of the ape. And we've got this person that's come back to biking and we are going to put all of our attention on making sure that we can satisfy that guy's demands and keep him in the market as long as possible. We lost sight of the young customer. We forgot how to innovate. Innovation isn't making a bike that does 300 mile an hour. Innovation is providing solutions that are for the moment. And when we talk about the millennials and the reason why they're absolute frightened of noisy, smelly, it, it, hot engines now dutch yes making it cool brilliant i completely take that argument and i think he's doing they're doing an amazing job but that will only ever penetrate so far we've got to bring products and solutions to the market that young people are going to engage with and it doesn't have to center around speed it has to center around technology and innovation and manufacturers unfortunately who i represent have lost sight of that because they've been too busy chasing my pound note and satisfying the things that I want rather than thinking about who the next customer is. And this is something we need to change. And this is something, and I'm speaking like this because I speak like this with manufacturers. I make it absolutely clear to them. They must start to think about what it is they need to change because otherwise we're the horse and cart society 
of the late 1800s who said the motor car will never catch on. This is the reality. And we have to come to terms with that. That's a really interesting point. And I think it goes back to what, what Dutch was saying as well about actually, the, you know, the, the source of power, these things is actually is less important now, I think, than than getting people interested in it and getting people on it. I, I've had a really interesting experience, and uh, not while we've been locked down, but just before we got locked down. Um, this thing next to me is a, it's a, a new GT, NIU GT, which I got on test literally the day before we got locked down. It's the first electric vehicle I've ever come across that I could be interested in for two reasons. One, because it's relatively cheap. With the, with the grand, it, well, it's three grand on the road. It's a Chinese built electric scooter. Um, it's built to a really high standard, um, much higher standard than the previous Chinese scooters I've come across. But more than that, the, the really neat thing about this is it's got, it's got two batteries. It's got two sort of car sized batteries, uh, which are removable. So you, so you don't have to, if you live on the eighth floor of a tower block and you need to charge it up on a night, you just remove the batteries, take them to your flat and charge them in the flat. And this is the first thing I've come across that, that actually thinks that it makes sense as an electric vehicle. It, it doesn't cost twice as much as a normal bike. It's, it works. It does 60 miles, which if I was commuting in and out of London every day would be enough. And it's easy to charge. And, and, and it, to me, this is the, you know, this is, somebody has now started to get it and I'm sure it won't be long before the other manufacturers do too. Um, and it just suddenly, it completely changed my view on electric bikes completely. Hmm. Can I, can I just say, I mean, another misconception, I think, with um, people about what MAG is and what MAG stands for is that they assume that we're against electric motorcycles. We're not in any way, shape or form. We, we, we represent motorcyclists. We couldn't give a monkey's if you, if you power your motorcycle with a rubber band or a hamster in a wheel. You know, it, it's, uh, the, the, the power source is not, not important. It's the fact that it's two wheels with a motor. Um, and I think it's important, uh, one point that Dutch made about the um, promoting two wheels as a, as a mode of transport. Um, we are working very hard to build bridges with the cycle lobby. Um, I've just been speaking with British, uh, British Cycling, try, trying to get to the point where we can come up with a, a, a joint position where we can say, look, two wheels is the best solution whether that has a motor, whether it's an electrically, pe uh, electrically assisted pedal cycle or a small step onto a, a, a throttle-based uh, uh, um, electric motorcycle, whatever, whatever it is, what, what we're looking at is two wheels because that is more environmentally friendly. It's a smaller, lighter weight vehicle, less, less um, environmentally impact, uh, impacted than, uh, than, a, than a car. If you look at the car industry, it's increasingly going towards larger and larger vehicles. Um, the, the increase in SUVs, um, the, the, the fact that the, the sheer weight of vehicles, I mean, I did a recent article in, in our members magazine looking at the, the weight of vehicles, you know, the same model of vehicle over the, over the period of 20 years, and the actual curb weight of these vehicles just keeps going up. For motorcycles, it stays static. So you've got, you know, your Honda CG125, whatever it is, it's pretty much the same size, the same weight as it was back in the 1970s. But if you look at something like the Mini, for example, possibly a bad example, but the original Mini um, was a very small, lightweight vehicle. Look at it now, it's, a, it's, a, it's an obese, overweight uh, thing. Then sticking an electric motor and batteries, you add another 30% to the weight. Um, you know, this is all going in the wrong direction. We need to be looking at small, lightweight, flexible vehicles. Colin, you're absolutely right. It sounds like you've been reading our policy document finally. But um, <laughs> what, 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 what I would say is that um, please remember that apart from consumers and what they're demanding from vehicle manufacturers, so whether it's automotive or motorcycles, is that regulation shapes these things. So manufacturers don't go out of their way to make a two-ton vehicle. Manufacturers are driven by regulation, which is primarily driven by safety. So when you end up with larger vehicles, with safety cells, airbags, and all of these technologies that we've seen evolve since the late, uh, sort of late 80s, early 90s, it's not because the manufacturers want to do that, it's because regulation has driven them to make these vehicles much safer. And by definition of making them safer, they become larger, they become heavier, and of course, manufacturers will then look at economies of scale. So they will turn around and say, well, if there's regulation in one part of the world that says we well, have to build a vehicle in a certain way, and generally, generally speaking, Europe leads on that, 
then they want to make those vehicles that then can comply with the regulation. Unfortunately, EU regulation is now being adopted in most of the Asia-Pacific Asia regions. So we're actually starting to see that the likes of India and the Indonesia area and Asia-Pacific area are starting to adopt the Euro regulation, which means even from a two-wheel perspective, we're going to see this shape vehicle technologies over the next few years. I think what will happen, and this is why we've been rattling on around the L category, is because we're starting to see the large automotives appreciate that they're no longer going to sell a large SUV that can be used in London or used in any major city around Europe and therefore how can we get access what can we do to be part of this urban landscape which is why you're seeing large automotive starting to invest into this sector so when we talk about L category motorcycles and L3 and moped is an L1 so and, and a Piaggio MP3 which you see a lot around London is an L5 can be ridden on a car license so we've got to remember there are opportunities for this industry and for the automotive sector to provide mobility solutions. And that's the argument that we've been trying to make. Why? Because I've always said, if we look after or we create a place for this sector, motorcycling as we know it today will take care of itself. If we don't succeed, we will be legislated out, which is where we are. So we can't make an argument for what yesterday looked like, we've got to make an argument for what tomorrow looks like. And whether that's an electric power two-wheeler or some other form of light vehicle, there is going to be a market that's going to explode and we need to be part of it. And our manufacturers need to be part of it. And they recognize this now. You know, in fact, our policy is being adopted uh, by, by ASEM in Europe. So there is a completely new approach and some forward thinking. And I think if we work together as a collective, these three organizations and others i think we can do a lot more than what we're currently doing but we all have to be consistently and on message and and, and that doesn't necessarily mean to be exactly what i'm saying but it has to be a combination of what we're all saying yeah, I've got i think um, can i can i can i jump in with just a comment on that because i sort of i agree but there's also something i think that i sort of dis disagree with a little bit I do think we should fight for the past. I do think we should fight for what motorcycling was a little bit. Um, I think that there's a huge culture in this country to preserve things that are good. Um, you know, we're the creators, the event inventors, the innovators, pioneers. Um, you know, we've got great British brands that build motorcycles. And I think it's really good to look to the future. I think it's really good to have future uh, future transport policy in mind when we look at powered two-wheelers in transport categories that governments understand and that fulfill European compliance. But I think we also should remember to, in parallel, fight for a way of life. Mm. And I don't mean the traditional way of life people associate with motorcycling, which is more often associated with sports bikes and Sons of Anarchy wannabes. Um, I think, you know, the idea of preserving culture in, in a more of a classic way. Um, I mean, it's interesting that a lot of the bikes that sell really well in, in kind of urban settings are those modern retros. There's, there's a whole mm. category of motorcycle capitalizing on still looking like Steve McQueen. Mm. And, uh, and it's a category of growth. It's a category that people accept. It's a category that people like the look of. It's, it's a category where we see, you know, we, we have two and a half thousand people through our doors every week and only half of them ride motorcycles. Mm. And um, so we see those people in the peripheries of biking that think biking's interesting. We see young people coming into riding because it looks accessible and less dangerous and more cool on these retro classic style bikes. They see it as stirring something they remember from the past or that their dads did that they liked or their grandfathers and i think we should fight for them to be able to continue to do that i think we see it preserved in media culture advertising music videos film i think it still exists there um and and also it's something that you know it, it fits in with kind of almost classic car culture and the culture of vinyl and the culture of old school mm. things so i think we we need we need parallel approaches um, mm. Because at the end of the day, you know, there are technology things that are all about transport and it might be the latest new scooter that is really clever and brilliant and has multiple batteries that swap out. I mean, I, I have to say I wouldn't get on that if my life depended on it. It's the most horrible looking thing I've ever seen in my life. Just horrendous. Um, but there are things I would get on. In fact, I was trying to pull up a picture discreetly while you guys were, were talking because there's, there's, I mean, because we do a lot of stuff in California now. I've spent, I've spent half of the last two years in, in Los Angeles, um, which, you know, trying to build out bike shed. 
And there's a company that we've been doing a lot of work with, and I'm going to hold something up to the screen. This is a Super 73. Mm -hmm. Now, that is a pedal uh, bicycle that looks really, really cool. Now, the bicycle community in LA hate that. They don't get it because um, it's not a bicycle and you don't wear Lycra and, uh, and it's not all about, you know, kind of pretending to be some sort of yellow jersey wearing person. So they've totally embraced motorcycle community and young people are getting into that. And when you see what they associate with, they associate more with uh, Easy Rider and Steve McQueen on those bikes than they do with Piaggio's latest ugly electric thing that's fantastic in the bus lane for getting to work on every day. So I think we need all of those approaches. And, and that's why I think it is good to work together, but let's not forget fighting for our right for culture, fighting for a right of preservation, fighting for the right of great British brands that build bikes that deserve to survive into the future, Absolutely. as well as this other stuff. Because I think, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we do have a, a sort of uh, old school Churchillian gung-ho spirit that, say, that sticks two fingers up to the man, to the system. And I think we need to keep doing that as well. You know, I, I think people respect it. I think they like it. You just need to not do it with wheelies and donuts and burnouts and people behaving like wankers, mm -hmm. which is the, that's the real problem we face. Yeah, I, th I think just uh, again, I'm going to I'm going to do what Colin done. I don't, I don't want to end up in a situation where we're misconceived. Uh, as an organisation, we, we accept everything that you've said, and we very much, uh, if you again look at our policy document, it's all about choice, lifestyle, and freedom. Because it is absolutely whether you want to uh, engage with what you've described, Dutch, or whether you want to do other things or you see yourself as a different motorcyclist or user of a light vehicle, you should have the ability to make those choices. And I think, therefore, those lifestyle protection elements are as important as trying to fight it into, into policy. As I said, one is a byproduct of the other. If you know the, the, the issues that the reason why we lost our voice is because during the mid 70s, you know, there was 10, 10, 10 million motorcycle license holders and there was a market that was half a million new vehicles a year. At the moment, we have just over a million, 1.2 million active users, predominantly weekend riders, and we have a market that's 100,000. The reason why we're no longer in the landscape and we're not in people's minds, as Colin said, is because we no longer make up the proportion of people out there that we used to and therefore i think that is in it a bigger argument that somehow we can bring all of these elements together under an umbrella that will then allow us to make a, a, a more uh, a more forceful argument as i said i think you know colin and i we've met a lot i've met with uh, colin's boss and and lembit we're all so passionate about what we do and what we represent but it is about making an argument that's acceptable to people that don't think the way we do and that's not the easy part so we've tried to get the coloring pens out create something that looks really friendly very very in touch with uh, where the government thinks they want to get to what a modern city looks like and that's the argument we're trying to say look forget all of that stuff don't worry about the wheelie the burnout the person and then I get hauled into a meeting when Ludgate Circus is the most dangerous junction in London and 40% of the accidents are motorcyclists that are pulling away from the, from, from the traffic lights at 50 mile an hour in the space of 100 yards. It's a very, very difficult. So going back to what we said before, we're going to launch an initiative this year which is going to try to get existing riders to become more responsible because the damage they're doing, Colin touched on it earlier, during this, particularly during lockdown, it is just appalling. No wonder people think the way they do about us. You know, even where I live, I'm on a motorcycle, popular motorcycle route. It's like Brands Hatch at the weekend at the moment. And these people are meant to be doing essential journeys. We're not doing ourselves any favours. And uh, anyone that's going to watch this podcast, please take it on board. I used to be one of those people back in the mid 90s and it is ruining it for all of us. You know what, we, we, should, we should all do a little shout out. All, all of us should say, listen, if you're watching this, you ride a motorcycle, stop riding like a wanker. Our way of yeah, life is under absolutely. threat. Just stop it. Just don't do it anymore. It's pointless. Go absolutely. on a track day. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. Uh, as, as an employee of MAG, it wouldn't be right for me to use, use the W word. But yes, I, I, I echo that uh, sentiment is that MAG is all about responsible use of motorcycles. So we... we we, we don't in any way endorse any of the stupidity that, that goes on. 
Um, I honestly believe it's a minority of people that do that. Um, the majority of motorcyclists are the ones who don't get talked about because they're the ones who are doing it correctly and responsibly. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's important, like I say, to, to, to echo the, all, all the comments there is that we need to work together. We've all got different things to bring to the party. Uh, we need to protect the motorcyclists that are on the road at the moment and we need to communicate in a way that doesn't alienate them. So when we're talking about futures and how it will be, you know, small, small little electric scooters that, like I say, the, your average Harley rider wouldn't look at sideways. Um, yeah, we've got, we've got to find a way of making sure that we're embracing all those people. There, there's a few of enough of it few enough of us as it is, we don't want to be losing any by putting out messaging that alienates certain groups. So we've got to try and be all inclusive to, to get the right message out to everybody. And that may well be by each of us as separate organisations having slightly, slightly varied messaging. Um, but ultimately, we're all on the same page. We all want to go in the same direction, which is making sure that motorcycling is still going to be there for our grandkids. Yeah, and that's you know I think that, again that comes back to to really what I was saying at the beginning. I, I it fascinates it fascinates me, and it's it's been really interesting watching watching this conversation as well because I think, you know, it's the the MCIA, the MCIA you know should be that big visionary, and and there are you know there are things that the MCIA can do and should be doing, but it's probably not the MCIA's job in this world to be making motorcycling look cool because there are other people who can do that differently and probably better. Um, but in, in the same way as it's not, you know, it's not necessarily Bike Shed's view to be, to be lobbying for the industry, you know, and, and, and I, re, I, I just, I like the fact that actually there are three groups represented here who, you know, who working together, you know, can pretty much achieve anything we want to, I think. Um, but I think you're right, you know, it, it does come down to us as riders as well. We have to have that responsibility. It's, you know, part of motorcycling, there's an awful lot of bullshit in motorcycling. We know that, you know, you, you've only got to look on any Facebook group and you'll see talk of, of people, you know, bravely saying what they're going to do this weekend. And we know most people don't go out and do that. Um, but it's up to us as riders to, you know, to acknowledge that, that, you know, every car we overtake, every car we go past is somebody we can influence. And... You know, and we can, as we as we overtake that car, they can either come away from that encounter thinking, "I really want to do that. That looks brilliant," or they can go away thinking, "What an idiot!" And you know, and and it happens on you know, for, it happens a hundred times a journey. It's yeah, it's it, a lot of it does come down to us, I think. So it does, and that's why it's interesting spending time in California because in California, riding a motorcycle is really a legitimate, nice pursuit, and people smile at you and wave at you and give you a thumbs up. And in fact, it's not a huge sports bike culture. You know, there are a lot of people there on Harleys, but actually I think California is one of the few states in America where Harley Davidson have less than 25% market share. And so there are a lot of people out there riding Triumphs and Ducatis. They love to be a bit different. Um, you know, there's Royal Enfields out there and Guzzies, and you'll see people almost making an effort to not ride American bikes. Um, but the culture out there is people ride more slowly. There are, there are huge amounts of places that welcome bikers and see them as an important part of their customer base. And, um, you know, yeah, there's, there's a little bit of a kind of old school sort of cliche biker culture, but actually more and more, it's just young, cool, interesting people. And I think if, if we remember that the industry is, is sort of slightly schizophrenic in that, you know, we make, or that, you know, the motorcycle industry makes transport machines, but they're making them for people who broadly buy them because of lifestyle and culture. So in some ways they've got more in common with somebody who makes a musical instrument or a watch than they have with someone who makes a car. And I think that's a really important shift in terms of understanding of the consumer. So if we only fight on one front, if we only fight on the transport front and we don't fight on the lifestyle front, we're not actually representing the riders who are riding for a different reason. I mean, it's a great excuse that my Triumph Bonneville is a great way to commute, but that's not why I've got a Triumph Bonneville, is it? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, I was, if I was really doing that, I would be riding around on some sort of clever electric scooter or maybe something I could carry up the stairs. So we need to fight both fronts. And if we don't do both, we're, we're, paying, we're, we're, not, we're doing a disservice to the people that we're actually fighting for. If, if I can just uh, come back on the, the, the point you made, Steve, about uh, the impression that every car driver has of, of us as we go past them. Um, that's part of the messaging that we're, we're putting out to, uh, around uh, International Ride to Work Day this year, uh, which uh, the Motorcycle Action Group is, is promoting in the UK this year. 
And what what we're trying to do is is develop a narrative where a car driver who sees a motorcycle filtering past them actually thinks to themselves, well, this is a good thing. So put, put that seed in their mind that every motorcycle that filters past them is one less car in the queue in front of them. So we're actually a benefit to the car driver, even though they're not on that motorcycle, not enjoying as much of a benefit as we are. By us being there, they are getting a benefit because it's, it's less congestion, less air pollution, less emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So yeah, there's a lot of positives that we want to get into the mind of the car driver. So Ride to Work Day is about a messaging uh, strategy that reaches out to those people who don't ride and possibly don't understand the benefits of motorcycling. That's, that's what we're trying to do with that campaign. 15th of June, don't anybody forget, 15th of June is Ride to Work Day this year. I think it, it is a really interesting idea because it's, you're so, so aware, you know, I, I spend a huge amount of my time at the moment riding on motorways. My, I, I now live 150 miles from, from the bike social office, so I spend a huge amount of time filtering on the M25, the M11 and the A1. And, and you you become very aware of, of, you know, just how you are perceived. And, and I, you know, I always try and make it so so my my actions don't have any negative impact. You know, I, I sort of feel if I make any car driver have to slow down or swerve or change their journey in any way, then I've failed. And, you know, and my my target for being a better rider isn't about shaving a second off my lap time on a Donington track day. It's about, you know, getting to work and annoying one less person than I did yesterday. And and I think, you know, it's it's a it's a simple thing, but if we can do that, it does make a difference. Yes, you, you, you also you you almost get to this position where you're trying not to be noticed as a motorcyclist, but then again we, we actually want to be noticed, so it's a bit of a <laughs> contradiction in terms there isn't it so but yeah we, we've got to get the positive image of motorcycling put into the heads of the people who are making the policy and don't understand what we're all about yeah I think, um, the, the transformation for me was going from being a sports bike rider in you know full black leather and black visor thinking i was super cool um to riding around on classic looking bikes and and dare i say it wearing an open face crash helmet because people smile at you when they can see your face when i ride if i ride around london on a Triumph Scrambler, even with relatively noisy exhaust pipe, um, people smile at me. Car drivers give me the thumbs up, and uh, and you know, and, and I ride pretty much the same. If I if I want to pass somebody, I pass them. I try and give them loads of room, and I give them the benefit of the doubt if they don't see me coming because I appear out of nowhere. Us bikers, we appear out of nowhere. I drive a car too. I mean, I, you know, I, sometimes I, I spend a lot of time swearing at bikers because they just uh, they ride like they're entitled and they own the road. So, you know, I see both sides of it, but it is a lot of how we present ourselves. And I think sometimes that cultural part is the bit where people will accept you more, where they will actually give you a bit of a thumbs up if you don't look like you're dressed for speed or dressed to be some sort of anonymous robot with a black visor on. And, and I think that's where we can play a role by embracing the cultural part of it to say, actually, you know, that guy, not only did he not annoy me the way he rode, um, but actually, oh, I wish I was on that bike. That looks quite cool. I can relate to that. It's relatable. And so I think that's that's part of it. And that's why I think, you know, we, we should really embrace and push that sort of friendly, happy face of almost old school motorcycling where, you know, nobody knows how fast the, the Triumph Thruxton I've got really is. You know, people go, oh, I'd love a classic old bike like that, much less dangerous. I'm, you know, that, that you know, from the kind of bikes I was riding in the, in the mid nineties, it's way faster than those sports bikes, but it just looks friendly. And, and I think, you know, that shift is what's embrace is what's bringing young people into biking. It's what's bringing people back to biking who gave it up because they thought it was too dangerous. And it's what's making the public and politicians not think we're all wankers. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, it, it, that's why I think it's an important thing to fight because, you know, my background is marketing and brand and creative. I worked in broadcasting and TV and advertising, and it's all about selling a story. And the story we need to say is biking is cool, relevant, credible, but actually it's acceptable. And, and that's the shift that we need to make because we're not just going to make it on emissions regulations or arguments about, you know, powered two wheelers being fantastic transport. People have to think it's a good thing and worth preserving. As Honda used to say, I think it was back in the 70s, you meet the nicest people on a Honda. So we, we, we need to get that kind of messaging back out there rather than, like I say, let's all get our knee down and, uh, and wear, wear sliders and, uh, and pretend like we're all uh, Valentino Rossi. Yeah. I'd like to be Valentino Rossi. <laughs> yeah, I'd quite like to be Valentino Rossi too. <laughs>
is that is that a good place? Is that a good place to finish? Do we, are we do we all want to be like Valentino Rossi? Absolutely, hundred <laughs> percent. Shall we uh, shall we call it a day there then, gentlemen? Thank you for thank you for your time. I really enjoyed that. Um, thanks again to our, our sponsor for this, which is uh, Bennett's Classic Bike Insurance. Um, yeah, please um, if you watched it, and enjoyed it, leave your comments below. Um, yeah, we're really enjoying doing it. Hope you're enjoying watching them. Thank you again, um, gentlemen, for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. I need to be looking my best. Dutch looks as groomed as ever. Well, obviously, I've been a little while in makeup. I'm going to get recorded on this interview thing. I'm just letting, right. letting it go, Grizzly Adams. I'm, I'm not cutting it off, not cutting any hairs off until after lockdown.